You didn't by chance happen to see mine. <laughs> no. Yeah, mine's missing. Oh, no, really? Really. So if anyone sees a Canon 7D with a 16 to 35 L and a Zacuto Z plate, it was mine. Here's the lens cap. So if I start crying, you'll know why. Okay. Okay, well, on to Premiere Pro because the show must go on. And uh, so last we left off talking about adjustment layers. And uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about before we move into After Effects um, is something that actually people have been asking for since we introduced this, uh, this very effect in After Effects CS 5.5, and that is the warp stabilizer. So what you have here in this clip, if we take a look here, oh, sorry, I'll put it in uh, loop mode for you. Um, here we have a shot which is very common of the shots we see today, uh, where it wasn't on any kind of stabilization rig, it was basically handheld, and it's very shaky. And as we mentioned earlier, as Paul was talking about, the ability to capture video on so many different kinds of devices, all the way from large format cameras down to your, your smartphones, is great, but it also means that the smaller the device, the smaller it gets, the smaller your glass, and the less that you have sort of stabilizing that device, you're just going to end up with more camera shake. So obviously, we wanted to provide a smooth solution, again, removing the frustrations from editing, to allow you to do this natively directly within Premiere Pro without having to go to After Effects. And of course, you can still use the same method that we implemented before. So again, I can come over to my effects panel here. I can type in, and you'll see that now available to you, we have the warp stabilizer. Go into my effects controls, where I've already analyzed my clip, turn on the warp stabilizer, go back into my non-cinema mode, but still kind of full screen preview. <laughs> We're not in front of clients now, it's okay. And you can see that it's very smooth, very nice, and it just works. By the way, something else which I wasn't able to show you before, but I can show you now. This is a really cool feature here. Um, it's called uninterrupted playback, where you can move around inside the interface. You can also play things that actually have sound, so that you could see that. Let's see, have some sound going on here. Sound on my laptop. Thank you very much. I thought the sound had left me as well. That's not the sound we want. No? Well, it's okay. You get the idea. I can move my meters around. They reflow. You can change the interface. Okay, that's okay. Kill sound, please. <laughs> this is not happening right now. Okay. So, play that doesn't stop. Now, what's essential about the warp stabilizer? Well, again, stabilization is not new, and of course there's been other plugins that you could do this with inside of Premiere Pro. Um, the key here is that we're doing a crop and auto scale, because if you simply just stabilize the clip, as you would expect, as the camera motion is being fixed to a, uh, a steady point, you're going to end up with all these sort of black bars, right? This is more than just letter boxing or pillar boxing. You're literally having this moving frame, which you would then have to go in and rescale, reframe, recrop. So by default, the stabilizer will automatically crop and auto scale. It just saves you time. You still have manual options. You can still keyframe this if you want. And of course, we also offer, also offer, English is not my first language, Rolling shutter ripple, which if I still had my 7D, I could tell you that is a very common issue with DSLR cameras, right? So rolling shutter, which effectively, as you pan across something, um, what happens is straight edges start to look bent, right? Because the shutter is, it's actually rolling as you move around. So rolling shutter straightens those edges out. Well, sometimes you want the handheld motion of a pan, but you don't want the rolling shutter artifacts, right? So with Warp Stabilizer, you're doing both. You can't disable one or the other. Rolling shutter reduction is always on, but the stabilization is on too. So in this case, we have now added in Premiere Pro and After Effects a standalone rolling shutter repair effect, which is awesome because now you can simply remove the rolling shutter artifacts and then continue to keep, you know, again, different styles of video. Sometimes you want that very raw, handheld, shaky, slightly pukey camera style, and now you can do that very easily and still remove the rolling shutter artifacts. Okay, so um, multi-camera. Now again, trying to remove frustrations from editing. One of the real limitations in Premiere Pro in the past was the way that we did multi-cam editing, primarily because since the reintroduction of Premiere Pro some, my goodness, eight, 10 years ago, we've had basically the ability to cut four cameras 
and that was it. And even to get started with multicam, how many of you in the past did multicam in Premiere? Show of hands. Thousands of hands. Okay. Well, probably many of you didn't because it was very simple. It took about six right clicks. You had to know exactly which menu to go to. By the way, none of them actually said multi-camera, <laughs> multi-camera sequence. You had to know where all these things were and things were being placed in all different locations and it was a lot of nesting. It was just painful. And most people thought Premiere didn't even do it because you just didn't find anything. Well now, we have no limitation on the number of cameras that are supported. So it's only limited. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and, well, come here. Hey, it wasn't me. I know it wasn't you. You can put more energy now in it. Oh. Go. On the lips? No, that's right. All right. <laughs> there we go. Oh, uh, well, I already kissed him. Well, you missed it. See, I say share the love. I mean it. Right? All right. Oh, that's so great. Thank you. Thank you. I need to change my pants, though. Excuse me for a moment. All right. Yeah! Okay, yes! Multicam! Any number of cameras you want. I can only get six on my laptop here, so that's just the way it is because I don't have a powerful machine, but you get the idea. I can right-click on them. I can choose Create Multicamera Sequence. I can choose to synchronize from my endpoints or via timecode. Choose my endpoints, which actually now gives me a new sequence. And by the way, if you didn't see that before, when you actually select the cameras, again, it actually says Create multi-camera source sequence. So right from the start, if you've never done it, oh, maybe I'll select cameras and make a sequence. Yes, that works. So once you do that, then you can take your multi-camera sequence and you can drag it into an empty sequence. And here's a little feature that we stole <laughs> from Final Cut. This clip does not match the sequence settings. Do you want us to change them or keep the existing ones? Now, this is one of those little, we, we have these things at Adobe called JDI, just do it. And this was one of them, because I'm sure many of you here, especially those of you who've worked in broadcast or whatever, you've been cutting something in HD, and someone says, oh, we need to do something else, and it's, it's actually in PAL, in 25, and 720 by 576. Oh, no problem. So you're taking all your mixed footage, remember, mixed cameras, mixed formats, mixed aspect ratios, mixed sizes, because we let you do all of that. So you're mixing all these things. It's awesome. You're cutting it together. It's done. And then you go to watch it, and you realize, oh, no, it's HD and 720, but it's supposed to be 1280, and it's wrong. Yeah. And there was no way to change the sequence settings because you set them at the beginning, sorry. So you could take everything out and copy it and paste it into a new one and hope that it all worked again, but bah! Can't we just change the sequence settings? Now you can. <laughs> that was a very long rant to say now we do that, so there you go. <laughs> okay, so we'll change the sequence settings. All right, go into our multi-camera monitor. And now, again, using the power of uh, my OpenCL GPU acceleration, you'll notice that it stacks your cameras in threes or fours. It depends on how many you have. Uh, in this case, I've got six running here. You can use, obviously, one through six on your keypad here. I can start the playback. We won't worry about sound. That's okay. It's just car noises. <laughs> So it's all cut together. Sound effects are included with CS6. Not those. Um, now we're down below, and you can see that as I scrub through my timeline, we're seeing the exact same thing happen in the multicam editor. If we get to something like this, where I cut to a camera that uh, ran out of film, I mean, um, ran out of, yeah, I just, I just, yeah, what's going on? That ran out of card space, um, you can very simply right click here, not on the edit point, but on the camera. Go to multi-camera, which you will remember from the previous version of CS 5.5, and I can say, oh, let's instead go to camera 5 and swap the camera out, and it doesn't change the duration, and you're just, you're just cutting across all those different cameras very easily. Again, all the same editing methods, the roll, the trim, dynamic trimming, all of that still applies. You're just doing it now inside this new uh, multi-cam specific sequence. Okay. So the last uh, two things that I'll show you here in Premiere Pro deal with audio. Now this is once again something which is direct feedback from our broadcasters. Specifically, many of them that are located at the Media Park in Hilversum. Audio workflow in Premiere. Anyone who's done it before knows that it was fairly limited and again, 
very frustrating. Well, we've removed those frustrations by now allowing you, very simply, to first, of all, first and foremost, mix and match stereo and mono audio clips. So stereo, yeah, <laughs> yeah. again, non-video people going, eh, but video people, yeah. <laughs> Woo, yes, all right, six clapping, that's okay. Okay, <laughs> this is cool, it should have been done, it's done now. Removing frustrations a little bit at a time. The other thing that we've done is, again, very broadcast specific, but more and more prosumer and just, you know, professional cameras that are accessible, accessible by all of us, some of which allow you to record four or eight or 16 channels of audio simultaneously. And we didn't deal with this very well in the past. Well, now if you go into the add track options, you'll notice that we actually have four different track types. The standard is what allows you to mix and match stereo and mono. The 5.1 is exactly as you'd assume. It's a 5.1 interleaved file. Mono, self-explanatory, mono only, and then adaptive. And adaptive is what allows you to take any format, so you can see here we have an MXF OP1A with multi-channel, and when you drop that, which contains four or eight or 16 audio channels, into an adaptive track, it will automatically adapt to the appropriate number of channels. You have the ability to control the output channel mapping, and then, of course, you have individual and independent control inside the audio mixer to process those as well. So adaptive channels, the mixture of stereo and mono, something which we've been working on, something which we were listening and trying to do better, and indeed, we have made it better. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to bounce over to After Effects and start uh, with this clip here. So what I have here is uh, this car, and by the way, you probably noticed that all of our assets for video were coming to us from Hot Wheels. Um, those of you who will remember Hot Wheels, the little toy cars, well, I guess they actually have a, um, a proper racing car brand as well. So this is one of the Hot Wheels cars that I think you can actually buy. It's called the Bone Shaker. Um, and we have this clip here where I wanted to attach some text to this Bone Shaker car, but specifically I wanted the text to fly out in 3D space tracking it on top of this 2D material. And you can see that as the car moves towards the camera, it is sort of moving in that Z depth, that Z space. So for this, I could right click and choose to create or replace with an After Effects composition, and that brings me into After Effects. Now, this is actually going to show off two features here. Man, I really went over time. Um, You'll notice first and foremost that we have this blue line. Now I'm gonna talk in a moment about global performance cache. What that blue line is actually representing is something called persistent disk cache, which I'll cover more in a moment. But what that basically means is that we are now storing cached frames from previous RAM previews, from previous cached renders. So when I go to hit play now, RAM preview, one, two, boom, it's already in real time. That's persistent disk cache, we'll come back to that. What we want to do is track a 3D camera, the ability to take 2D material, choose track camera, and then automatically apply 3D tracking points to 2D material. Now what's unique about this feature is one, could you do this in 5.5 and beyond in After Effects? Yes, not automatically, and it was very painful, right? And you had to really know what you were doing. And to make something look good in 3D perspective, we all know, right? It's very easy to make bad-looking 3D, bad-looking text fly in and out, right? It's very easy to do that poorly. To do it properly, efficiently, hmm, typically takes a bit more skill. Well, now we've made it easier for you to start that process to get there, and this effect works in the background. So you'll see that it's already processed now, and as I move over my car, you'll see that we have all of these tracking points. Now I'm just going to shrink down my target zone here a little bit bigger so I can see what I'm doing. And as I hover over these points, what it's actually showing me are the different 3D perspectives where I can add my text or object. So I just need to find one that looks fairly correct. This one looks okay, I don't know if it's exact. I'll choose this one, okay. Right click, notice I can choose to create text, solid, null in camera, shadow catcher camera and light. I'm going to choose some text. This is called Bone Shaker. Let's twirl this down. And again, we're just going to do a little bit of scaling on here. That's a bit small, something like that, okay? And again, we can adjust the X and Y rotation if need be, just to sort of uh, make this a little bit better, a little bit more precise. That actually looks pretty good. 
you know, maybe tilt it up a little bit, and we can actually just move this also. Because effectively, what we want this to do, maybe even move it up a little bit more, is we want this to come flying out at us from off screen, like this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, just, just to emphasize here, notice, okay, it is tracking. Yes, tracking is not new to After Effects. But notice, it's growing as it gets closer to you, right? This is, it's maintaining the proper 3D perspective from that 2D image. And it did it automatically. If you noticed, yes, there are lots of parameters and things that you can modify, but in one right-click step, it got you most of the way there. Now, this ties into the second feature that I wanted to show you here before we get to Global Performance Cache, which is um, some of our new abilities to work with extruded and, tr and um, 3D ray trace text. So we have a new three, 3D ray trace render engine, say that six times, um, in After Effects CS6. Now, we still offer the same traditional classic scanline 3D renderer, okay? But now we have the ray trace 3D renderer. Why ray tracing? Well, you can probably answer that. Ray tracing, first of all, gives you better looking 3D, more realistic light, soft shadows, depth of field blur, light transmission, right? And it's just better. Now, ray tracing, however, typically comes at the cost of, you know, some real time performance. But as you'll notice, now again, this is in a, in a sort of preview mode here, even with my ray traced 3D extruded text, which by the way, if I twirl this down, and I go to some of my geometry options here. Of course, we can add things like uh, bevels. I won't do that to you. Um, you can continue to extrude. You can see that I've got a light on here. So again, I can adjust the, the rotations. And you can see how that this is actually being affected by the lighting. But again, using the ray traced 3D renderer, I'm able to scrub through this. And it, it, feels, it feels real time. Yeah because this is now leveraging something else known as the global performance cache as well. But we'll get to that in just a second because I want to show you really some of the incredible benefits of global performance cache. So here is kind of the finished product with ray traced uh, 3D extruded text that's been tracked on 2D space. We'll go to our RAM preview. Notice the blue line, one, two, boom. It's playing in real time now, flying through and off the screen. And I want to see this in the context of my Premiere Pro edit, right? We started in Premiere. So I can now take this clip, if I hadn't already sent it over, and drop it into Premiere Pro's project panel. I can double click here. I can play it inside the source monitor. Again, JKL for playback here. I can take the video track. I can simply drag it right on top of the original. And again, you can see that we have a red line in Premiere. The red line, of course, typically indicating in an NLE that this won't play back in real time. But of course, in CS6, with the Mercury playback engine, it means, eh. <laughs> because of something called fractional playback resolutions, you can determine the best performance for your system. So when I wind this back, I hit play. <laughs> It just plays in real time. Thank you. Again, I don't even think you need to be a video person to realize that's coming to us live from After Effects' timeline, and it is so unbelievably fluid. Yeah, I hear all kinds of cursing in the front row. Yeah, it is. This changes the way you work in After Effects. Now, to really illustrate that, and unfortunately, I think this is going to be the end of my time. I've got about two more things I can show you here. I want to point out to you, I want, I, I want you to understand the work that's been done with this feature. After Effects, extremely powerful, common in almost any pre-post-production house in the world. But it's always been lacking in one area, and that is real-time. It's not a real-time app. You're expected to render and pre-render to see your work. And of course, just like any other design type application, after all, we used to say After Effects is really just Photoshop with a timeline, which of course Photoshop didn't have then, and it does now, so it's kind of similar. Um, <laughs> you try out things, right? Oh, let's try this color correction effect. Let's try this blur. Let's try this very somewhat realistic looking lightning stuff. You could try these things and see if they work. But every time you would try something, you have to re-render it. 
And you can see here that this is what we call a nested comp, right? So just like layer sets, lots of different compositions nested into one, and each one of those comps has multiple layers with multiple things, effects, mapping, all kinds of you know, masks, whatever. So you would have to re-render. Well, the global performance cache allows you to work with effects to add processes without having to re-render. You only render the new frames. So we're going to start on my beautiful lightning here, and we're going to add a color correction tint effect. And I'm going to choose to map the black to this red. So now you can see, got like this little red hue. And you'll notice that my green line goes away. But now, it only has to render the tint effect. So when I hit RAM preview, one, two, three, I'm already in real time. Global Performance Cache remembers all of the other frames. But wait, there's more. Because I keep trying things. So I say, OK, I think I want to add this colorize effect to the, all the background objects. Ah, that looks horrible. But that's OK. Yeah, it does. I know, thanks. Um, our green line goes away. Here's my point. Maybe it'll look better in real time. One, two. It's playing in real time. No, that definitely does not look any better. So now when I take it off, in the past, I would have to re-render everything again. But Global Performance Cache remembers everything. So watch this. Let's undo and take off this blue wash effect. Control Z, undo. Green line restored. We have the red lightning. Go to the lightning layer. Let's undo changing the tint, map black to red. The green line goes away. Let's take the tint off altogether. The green line comes back. And now, we're in real time. If you close out of the project and come back, it remembers these cached frames. And if you save the project, close the application, and come back later or come back tomorrow, you will see the blue line. That's called the persistent disk cache. This allows you, it will cache not all, but many of the frames to disk and keep those. You have complete control over how big that cache is and where it goes, and it just gets you up and running into real time that much faster, right? So much faster. So the global performance cache truly changes the way you work in After Effects. It changes the way that you design in After Effects. And it gives you a true freedom to create literally almost as fast as you can think, which is really, really quite something. Okay. The very last thing that I just want to show you here, this was an acquisition that we made, the ability to once again work with our partners, our other friends in the NLE world. So if you want to import Final Cut or Avid projects, now you can do that through Pro Import After Effects, formerly known as Automatic Duck. Yes, I heard some quacking out there. Very good. Thank you very much. You can open the XML here. If this looks familiar to you, again, you have your FCP and Avid Media options here. You can enable video audio on your video layers, click OK, open that. It creates a brand new XML project directly inside of After Effects. Any metadata that was placed there will be there. The audio will be there. All of your video will be there. Creates a separate new sequence, which we can now see here. And I can just kind of scrub through this and let you see it. And that's it. Simple integration, again, allowing you to move across all of these different applications very, very fluidly. All right. So my friends, my time has long been up. Thank you for uh, enduring that. Thank you for... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Once again, always in Amsterdam, there's always something unique that happens. And today, it was that I kissed my colleague on the lips for finding my camera. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Gert. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so again, oh, we need to switch back to uh, my slide, to this slide, to my desktop, okay? You know, so remember, friends, that at the end of the day, we have some things to tell you about that are very specific. Oh, this is the hiding issue here. Um, that are very specific to, you know, what's going on in the cloud. And what is going on in the cloud is that we are, of course, offering this introductory offer to you. So if you're on CS3, 4, or 5, for 29 euros a month, you can use everything that you saw today. And you can use it even if you're using other applications. Does that sound salesy? Yes. But it's salesy, yes. It's a way to get you started, right? It's a way to get in. If you're already using it, very inexpensively, you can be using all the new stuff. If you're in a small post-production house, you can get your freelancers on it and get them using it right away, all right? 
The cloud is real. The cloud is here. And uh, we invite you to check it out. Mr. Tooker, thank you. Thank you, Jason, Paul, Don, Peter.